An Indian poet once said that if the tiger stalks the jungle like the lowering clouds of an approaching storm, the leopard moves as silently as mist drifting on a dawn wind. Of all the great cats, the leopard represents the ultimate in power. Prophet Jeremiah measured an improbable event by recording in the Old Testament that you might as well expect a leopard to change its spots. This is the story of one leopard that very nearly did exactly that. Our story is set in the jungles of India and Sri Lanka, the modern name for Ceylon. Throughout the Indian subcontinent, the leopard still exists in fair numbers. The leopard is a very adaptable creature, as much at home in the trees as on the ground. The demands of close on a million years of evolution have produced the almost perfect predator. Leopards usually hunt by night, though there are exceptions, as we'll see. In moonlight, that white belly fur breaks up the shadowed outline that might otherwise betray the attacker to its victim. In daylight, that pattern of spots and rosettes provides superb disruptive camouflage. The golden fur mirrors the dappled sunlight of the forest. Provided it stands still, a leopard as little as 10 yards away is all but invisible. Only two body areas lack this nearly perfect camouflage, the underside of the tail and the backs of the ears. These white signals help the young to follow the parent when they move together through the nighttime jungle. An adult female weighs only 120 pounds, a male perhaps 30 pounds more, but they are immensely powerful. Leopards have been known to carry prey half as heavy again as themselves up into the branches of a tree. That beautiful spotted coat is too often the leopard's death warrant. Except for man, a fully grown leopard has no enemies to fear. Just how successful the leopard is can be judged from the fact that there are 24 different subspecies that range from the hot grasslands of Africa to the cool forests of Manchuria. Each race differs only slightly in body outline and colouring, though every individual leopard in the world has a set of spots as unique to itself as fingerprints are to a man. Because it is such a successful hunter and is so secretive in its ways, the leopard manages to cling on throughout a good deal of the old world. Yet because of the premium put upon its fur by illegal hunters, the distribution of the leopard is gradually shrinking. Today, the leopard's range still extends across much of Africa and the East. A hundred years ago, it existed across most of northern Africa as well, and at its southern tip. It was widespread in Manchuria and Mongolia. In Asia, the leopard fights a losing battle against an ever-growing human population. One place where it enjoys security there is Dudwa National Park in India, close to the Nepalese border. Our story of the leopard that changed its spots is set at Dudwa, and at a farm nearby 
called Tiger Haven. Dudwa National Park is one of the last unspoilt wildernesses in the vastly overpopulated subcontinent. Tiger Haven lies just outside the park and is separated from it by a river. It is the home of an extraordinary man called Billy Arjun Singh. And it's also the home of a very extraordinary leopard. Billy Arjun Singh is a conservationist who was recently honoured by the World Wildlife Fund with the award of its gold medal. In the early 60s, he made his 260-acre farm, called Tiger Haven, into a sanctuary for wildlife. Tiger Haven perfectly complements the 83 square miles of Dudwa National Park, excellently run by India's Forest Department. Dudwa is a sanctuary for five species of deer, including the beautiful spotted cheetle. Grey langurs browse on the leaves of the forest canopy. They are perpetually on the alert to warn the other jungle inhabitants with their cries when tiger or leopard are about. One leopard is always about. Her name is Harriet. Harriet was presented to Arjun Singh as an orphan a few weeks old. Her mother had been killed for her coat and the cub found abandoned. The plan was for Billy to rear Harriet and then introduce her to the wild. Billy was an ideal choice and not simply because he was a well-known conservationist, he has a fantastic understanding of big cats. Billy had already successfully reared and released a male leopard into the wild. He soon proved he could establish the same relationship with Harriet. She thrived on bottle feeding and human care. We join Harriet's story when she is three years old and in the full glory of her young strength. Billy's sympathy for and understanding of big cats is possibly unique. So-called tame, or at least tame reared leopards, are notoriously unreliable, prone to sudden fits of savagery that can tear a man's body apart or fracture his skull. With Billy and even his assistant, Harriet was always trustworthy and almost overwhelmingly affectionate. At Tiger Haven, Harriet didn't lack for animal companions. When she was three, Billy adopted a tiger called Tara, another female. As with Harriet, he planned one day to return the tigress to the wild. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, she made a splendid playmate for the leopard. They even took walks together, though Harriet usually preferred to show her seniority and independence by lagging behind. Then there was Billy's mongrel dog, Ely. Surprisingly, Ely came first in the pecking order, dominating both Tara and Harriet. But then she was boss at Tiger Haven long before either Harriet or Tara arrived as helpless cubs. Leopards normally enjoy eating dogs, but not this leopard, or this dog. Someday, Harriet would have to go back into that wild world just across the river. 
Billy was pretty sure she'd choose her own moment, but meantime, it was pure joy for him to have such a cat about the house. Slowed up action reveals the power which makes the leopard so deadly when it attacks. In the amazing play scenes that follow, you can watch Harriet actually pulling her punches as she spars with the dog Ely, whose skull she could so easily crush. the short accelerating rush from ambush, the full frontal view that is the first and last that its victims ever see of a charging leopard. With Harriet, these were mere playful pleasantries with Billy as the make-believe prey. Those claws can tear a deer or a wild pig apart. When playing with Billy, she always retracted her claws and never left a scratch on his body. The first sign that Harriet hadn't lost her wild instincts came in her third year when she started to go off hunting on her own at night. Early one morning, she killed a cheetle fawn inside the park. As if to prove that she knew how to support herself, she brought the kill back to Tiger Haven. Just as a leopard in the wild might carry its prey up into a tree, so Harriet stored her kill well out of reach of Ely. One morning, the alarm calls of the Grey Langers alerted Billy to the fact that Harriet was somewhere down by the river that formed the border with the National Park. Billy had a feeling that Harriet wasn't just there for a drink and that an even stronger instinct was governing her behaviour. Recently, he had heard the rasping sound of a leopard calling at night from across the river. It was almost certainly a wild male. Unlike tigers, Leopards are not really at home in the water. They don't care for swimming. But Harriet obviously meant to cross the river somehow. Billy could easily have ferried her in the boat, as he'd often done, but now he wanted to see what she would do if left to solve the problem for herself. Harriet finally launched herself 
and swam as if she'd been used to water all her life. Billy followed Harriet for some distance. Leopards mark their territory by leaving scent on trees and bushes. Harriet showed considerable interest in what were plainly a male's calling cards. She rubbed herself against the base of a scent marked tree as a sign that she too had passed. Harriet now spent more and more time away in the jungle. Billy was sure she'd soon mate with the wild male. Almost without exception, wild leopards move around and hunt mainly at night. So Billy could therefore no longer hope to share Harriet's life out there in the forest. There is one place, however, where leopards conduct their lives in daylight. And that's where we now must go if we wish to understand the life that Harriet had chosen to lead. Sri Lanka, the modern name for Ceylon. Wilpatu National Park. 480 square miles of jungle surrounding large and beautiful water holes. There, because they are the number one predator, there are no tigers, the leopards are creatures of the day rather than hunters of the night. These cheetle, known here as spotted deer, are identical with the ones Harriet would now have to hunt for her living. This male might be Harriet's consort. He's certainly behaving true to the form of amorous leopards everywhere. He's sawing, giving the rasping call that tells rival males and possible mates that he's around. The spotted deer respond with a whistling alarm call. There's only one basic leopard, Panthera pardus, though colours, spotting and build differ slightly from country to country. Choice of prey depends on what is locally most available. Wild pigs are high on any leopard's list of delicacies. Leopards are particularly fond of the tender young piglets. This leopard means business. The adult pigs recognise the menace in that stalking gait Now, another kind of approach for quite another purpose. The spotted deer with fawn is wary and stamps in alarm, but she isn't seriously worried. The stealthy approach isn't intended for her, and she seems to recognize the fact. The stalk ends with two young leopards at play. There's nowhere else in the world you could see such a thing happening in broad daylight. The 
play fight finally panics the spotted deer. Deer are these leopards' main quarry, including the larger and far heavier samba. That's an adult samba stag, and here's a female. Leopards prey on quite small animals too, like the black-naped hare. Some leopards, usually young ones, even specialize in catching birds. Grey langurs, one of the most agile and wary of monkeys, hate leopards and are always on the lookout for them. Despite their agility in the trees and on the ground, they sometimes get caught. These langurs are simply plain. The leopard's only large rival predators are the big crocodiles, who lie half submerged and grab deer when they come to drink. These crocodiles have killed a young buffalo. The sloth bears are termite eaters, so they're not really rivals, though some incredible fights between leopards and bears have been seen. When standing upright, a sloth bear is six feet tall. Leopards are solitary animals. They seldom consort with their own kind except to play together as youngsters and as adults to mate. Though they are loners, they are continually advertising their presence to other leopards. They do this by scent marking. Male and female both leave their visiting cards wherever they go. If you're admiring that magnificent spotted fur, reflect on this grim fact. It takes from five to seven leopards to make one leopard skin coat. The fur trade now bans leopard skins internationally but illegal hunting still goes on for black market traders. A female leopard has passed this way, spraying her scent mark high up on a tree. The male detects it in the same way that Harriet would have detected her future mate. You might expect leopards to keep away from tracks frequented by man, but they often use them for preference. Tracks make for much easier traveling than the matted undergrowth of the jungle, and the sand aids silent movement. In the jungle, even a leopard can't avoid making a little noise by disturbing twigs and leaves. There's another scent mark. Follow the spoor of a leopard along one of these sandy tracks and you discover that a travelling leopard leaves the path every 20 yards or so to blaze its own scent trail. It's incredible that such a solitary creature should need to keep in touch with its own kind to such a degree. A good deal of this scent marking is a territorial warning to others to keep off the originator's home range. And of course, quite a bit of it is part of the ritual of courtship and mating. The 
The main reason the leopard is so successful over a range that extends from near desert to rainforest, from sea level to high altitude, is that it has few special demands. All it requires is a plentiful supply of prey and water. Here, it has both. The leopard has two main methods of attack. Sometimes it waits poised in a tree. This tactic has two advantages. Prey animals seldom look upwards for danger, and the leopard's scent tends to get carried away on the breeze. It also has disadvantages. Success depends on the victim standing or passing conveniently underneath. Another problem. In the treetops, there are the vociferous and ever-present langurs who give the game away by sounding the alarm. Spotted deer are never slow to take the hint and to repeat the alarm call in their own high-pitched fashion. Most of the time, leopards catch their prey by stealth and at ground level. This time, the deer are too wary, and the leopard knows it. This leopard possibly hasn't eaten for 24 hours, and he's determined to get a meal somehow. Now that the deer have fled, even a hare wouldn't come amiss. Eventually, at the side of the waterhole, he finds something even better on the menu, piglets every leopard's favorite snack.
This is not this leopard's lucky day. Wild pigs with their slashing tusks are extremely formidable opponents, particularly when defending their families. While the adult pigs gather up their young and lead them back to the waterside, let's just see that attack an incredible routing of the leopard in slowed up action. When the leopard leaps in the air to escape, you can just see that his tail is badly bent. He also has a tusk slash on his offside front leg. He's probably lucky to escape so lightly after onslaught by around 600 pounds of furious pig. Leopards can afford to spend a great deal of time doing absolutely nothing. This isn't to say that a leopard will only hunt when it's hungry. Even when it has a full stomach, an easy chance to kill is very often taken. But most of the time, especially after feeding, leopards spend relaxing in the way that only cats seem fully to understand. Like all highly efficient predators, they don't waste energy that they would simply have to replace by more hunting. Movement is always leisurely. Nervous fidgeting is left to the potential victims. In leopard country, spotted deer can't afford to relax, ever. This, then, was the world of the wild leopard, which Billy Arjun Singh's hand-reared leopardess Harriet had entered when she strayed into the jungle from her home at Tiger Haven. Harriet stayed away for some time. Then one day, just as unexpectedly as she had vanished, she was back. Harriet seemed to take up exactly where she'd left off in her relationship with Tara and with Billy. She was just as affectionate, but as the weeks went by, Billy became certain that she was pregnant by a wild leopard she'd met in the jungle. As her three-month pregnancy developed, he prepared for the birth by building her a treehouse close to Tiger Haven. Harriet took to the treehouse at once, and as the time of her confinement drew near, refused to leave it. From time to time, Billy visited the treehouse to see that all was well. Then one morning, when he climbed the ladder, Harriet had a surprise for him. Two small newcomers. A leopard heavy with young is at a disadvantage when she has to hunt. Nature compensates for this by making her pregnancy a short one of between 90 and 105 days. But a short pregnancy means that the cubs are born, just like domestic kittens, blind and nearly helpless. By leaving them unable to move but safely hidden in a den, the mother is free to go hunting and therefore to produce milk for her offspring. On their mother's milk, the cubs doubled their birth weight in four weeks and trebled it in six. 
their eyes opened on the ninth day. Ely, a mother of several litters herself, definitely knew that something was up. Right from the start, Harriet let Billy visit her and even left her cub for a while to give him a reassuring lick. It all seemed too good to be true. But the wild instincts were still stirring in Harriet and she soon showed that she had her own plans for her two cubs. Three weeks after their birth, Harriet decided to move the cubs into the jungle. Perhaps the treehouse didn't feel safe enough. Almost certainly, she felt the need for a more natural lair. Luckily, Billy saw her leave with a second of the cubs. He followed her at a discreet distance, using the alarm calls of the disturbed langurs as a guide. After a while, the cries of the monkeys ceased. This meant that they could no longer see Harriet, and he became scared that he'd lost her. Then she reappeared from some tall grass. Harriet was making for a hollow at the base of a tree. He'd found the den that she'd chosen, and there inside was the first cub. Harriet had a good look around to make sure no other predators were watching before she deposited her second cub. Now she was back in the wild, Billy was worried that even his presence might disturb her. She was obviously much more wary out here in the jungle. So he built a grass blind, or machan, from which to observe her. Very little study had been done on lepers rearing young in a wild state, and this was a unique opportunity. Leopard cubs grow quickly. They're weaned in three months. After that, they share their mother's catches, starting on a diet of raw flesh, which will last the rest of their lives. At four months, they begin to follow their mother on her nightly excursions, learning the difficult art of hunting. At the age of two, they're experienced enough to live a completely independent life. Possibly because this was her first litter, Harriet had only produced twins. Female leopards sometimes give birth to as many as six young, though three is a more normal sized family. At two weeks old, the cubs were very active and had to be restrained from crawling out into the menacing green world of the jungle just beyond the entrance to the den. There was always the warm and comforting presence of their mother for reassurance. But now a factor far beyond Harriet's control was entering the family life. The monsoon was approaching fast. This year, the first storms broke early. From the safety of Tiger Haven, Billy became increasingly worried about the fate of the cubs. The den was in an old riverbed, and with the amount of rain that was falling, the lair was bound to be flooded very soon. With luck, Harriet might carry the cubs to higher ground. If not, then they must surely drown. On the second day of the floods, Harriet miraculously appeared at Tiger Haven. She was carrying one cub in her mouth. Harriet made straight for her favorite upstairs room. 
the kitchen. It seemed that she linked her own early days of security at the farm with the safety of her cubs, or rather, cub. There was still one to be accounted for. After dropping her first cub, Harriet seemed reluctant to leave. Billy was afraid that this meant that the other cub had already drowned. He tried to calm and reassure her. Within the hour, the rain eased off a little. Harriet got up and walked quietly out of the house. No sooner had she set off across the bridge than the storm broke again with even greater intensity. The river started to rise more rapidly than before. At this rate, the bridge leading to Tiger Haven and safety would soon be cut off. In an hour, she was back with the second cub. Both cubs were none the worse for their soaking. While the monsoon raged outside, Harriet and her family proceeded to take over most of the kitchen's floor space. At the end of two days, the storm finally blew itself out. Strangely enough, the fish were the worst affected by the deluge. Silt brought down by the floods had clogged their gills, so they were forced to gulp surface air to survive. For a week or so, the half-drowned forest got a brief respite. But no sooner had the water levels begun to drop than Harriet and one of the cubs were found to be missing from the farm. On a hunch, Billy hurried to the riverbank. There they were, waiting by the boat in which Harriet herself had often crossed during her excursions with him into the National Park. Though she'd already swum the river on her own, she obviously wasn't going to risk it carrying a cub. Taking care not to panic her, Billy ferried mother and child across the swollen river. As soon as the bow touched the far bank, Harriet stepped carefully ashore and headed off into the jungle. She dropped the first cub in the tall grass and immediately returned to Tiger Haven for the second. There, a strange thing happened. Instead of going directly to the boat, Harriet made a complete tour of the upper story. It was almost as if she was reluctant to leave the safety of Tiger Haven. Finally, she set off for the river.
until she reached the boat did her pace slacken, and then, with a last look round, she clambered aboard. Even though Billy Arjun Singh had planned all along to return Harriet to the world, he was still sad to see her go. This time he felt somehow that she was taking her cubs away for good. As a leopard raised in human surroundings, her life in the jungle would be full of hazards with which truly wild leopards are better equipped to deal. She would, for instance, be far too trusting with human beings. Whatever the laws protecting them, all leopards still carry a price tag on their coats for the unscrupulous hunter. With the worst of the monsoon still to come, the survival of her cubs was by no means certain. Whatever the outcome, there was nothing that Billy could do to influence events. Harriet's wild nature had proved stronger than any other tie. When she stepped off the boat this time, Billy Arjun Singh sensed that this was a final parting. For some days, Harriet kept her cubs within easy reach of the river, as if she was reluctant to lead them too deeply into the jungle where tigers and sloth bears roamed. After this, Billy saw the cubs on only one more occasion. They were learning to be proper little tree-climbing leopards under Harriet's devoted tuition. days after these scenes were filmed, Harriet and the cubs vanished. It seems, after all, that there is no way that a leopard can really change its spots, and the jungle, with all its mysteries, delights and dangers, lies out there beckoning. <laughs>